Welcome back to Beyond the Wrench. My name is Jay Ganinen, and I am your host. Before we get started, I want to invite you to our upcoming roundtable on March 21st at 1 p.m. Central Time. The topic is celebrating women in wrenching and uh, should be a, a really good conversation. We'll be talking with some amazing women who work in the industry to find out how they got started, what they love about the profession, and advice on how we can attract more women into the industry. You can sign up to attend for free on wrenchway.com slash events. We'll also put the link in the show notes below. Speaking of amazing women in automotive, I'm excited to introduce our guest for today's episode, Jessica Talicious, uh, who is the chair of Women in Auto Care. How are you doing today, Jessica? Yeah, great, Jay. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, I, I'm uh, excited for this conversation. You're a, a fascinating person in general, so this will be a fun conversation. Uh, but uh, you just got finished up with your conference. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it was an amazing few days. I think we did a really nice mixture of mixing people who came with their companies and giving them a chance to reconnect with their employees throughout the country and also giving them opportunities to mix and network and meet people from across the business. Uh, we've gotten pretty amazing feedback on, on it. We, ha we It kicked off with a car care awareness. So we had Caitlin French, who is someone who we've awarded a scholarship to, and she came in and she taught everyone a little bit about car care maintenance. And so she talked about synthetic oils and conventional oils and what goes in what hole so that no matter what part of the business we are in, we have a basic understanding of how vehicles work and especially, you know, how our own cars work, right? So because those are the methods that get us around and help us support our families. And the amount of buzz that came out of this year's conference, uh, you know, everybody it felt like on LinkedIn was <laughs> it was talking about it. And uh, it, it was just from watching it from afar, it looked really cool. Like it just, it seemed like everybody was having fun. They were learning, they were networking. Uh, it, it just seemed like everybody had a blast. Yeah, I, we did. We have some pretty incredible people like Jackie Lutz, who are the voice of our industry. I like to say she's our industry's influencer, um, but we certainly do. I think that there were such incredible takeaways and such incredible moments throughout the conference. And then we wrapped it and ended it with everyone going around the room and sharing what they're going to take back to their companies and how they're going to be better because of it. And not every company can send every person or every woman to this conference. So that's really complicated. So the fact that people were able to take something away and we're going to start creating these roundtables over the next couple of weeks so that I can take it back to everybody at Highline Warren and say, I know you couldn't come to the conference, but here are the biggest things that we wanted to share with you. And here are some things that can help you make your team better. I like the, the takeaway aspect because I think you can go to a conference and get really excited about what everybody's doing and talking about and then get into your get back to your day job and that excitement wanes and some of the takeaways that you, you talked about kind of fade away, right? And I think being able to have something where you almost take – those key pieces from what could have been overwhelming and summarize them so that you know what your what your objectives are when you when you go back to your shops. It, it, very powerful stuff. Yeah, we had this amazing MC. Her name is Sharon Washington, and she spoke to us last year at our conference. And you know, normally you don't like to repeat, but she was such a powerful speaker that we brought her back to be our MC and to close the conference out. And what she does is she takes you through these exercises to determine what are you really good at. And what are you really passionate about? And then how can we take what you learned and make the next step? And then she has people commit to it there in the room. So, for example, one of my team members is really passionate about getting more involved with the sustainability of our industry, right? Um, having having a car and maintaining it is in, a, in and of itself a form of being green and a form of sustainability. So how can she really take that to the next level? She majored in environmental politics, and now she's selling oil. So, so how can we make sure that we touch back to what's really important to her and what she's passionate about uh, within the scope of our industry? Pretty powerful stuff in general. Uh, I, I applaud you and all of the women that were in Palm Springs. I believe it was Palm Springs, right? It was. And it snowed, if you can believe it. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't think it ever snows in Palm Springs, but everybody said we have to go somewhere warm. And of course we end up somewhere and it's snowing. So next year, I think we go all in and go to a mountain somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Mother nature didn't want to be excluded. Uh, She wanted in as well. So uh, how did you get to this point in your career? So you're, you're the chair of the women in auto care association and, and really it's, Interesting to me because in our conversations prior to this, uh, I think your path is is unique, right? I, I think it's interesting. But what what led you to become what you are? Yeah, well, that's a that's a big loaded question, isn't it? Jen? It is. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, I I didn't think I would end up in the automotive industry. I didn't know that many people in the, especially not in the automotive aftermarket. My dad was in the dealership business. So I understand a little bit about that. I know you have a lot of dealership fans and a lot of aftermarket fans. So I, I grew up understanding, you know, this much about it, uh, but I wanted to be an attorney and I really wanted to go to law school, but not to practice law necessarily, but I really wanted to mix it with business. Um, I thought that the learnings that you could get from the Socratic method were so incredibly valuable that it would be worth it. And so I got accepted and I got ready to go. And then I started looking at how much it was going to cost. And I thought, holy, oh my gosh, <laughs> maybe I should go and just make some money. Um, so I went and I, I call it my quarter life crisis when I decided not to go to law school. And I worked for St. Jude in sports marketing for a couple of years. And that was a blast. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then I was recruited to go become a manufacturer's representative in the jewelry, home decor, and fashion business. And I did that for about 10 years and eventually opened my own consulting business where I helped boot small boutiques and small businesses like interior designers and um, a luggage company and a jewelry company, different companies that had different functions that they needed to build. Um, that was a ton of fun. While I was doing that in the background, I was being recruited um, at NA Williams to be a manufacturer's rep there. And they had the foresight and insight that they wanted to pull someone in with a diverse background, right? Who understood what being a rep was like, but could bring different perspectives to the business. Um, So I have, I really applaud and have so much admiration for N.A. Williams. And I was there for um, just under, I guess, a little under 10 years. And what I love about being a rep is that it is constantly changing. There's so much different, so many different businesses. You get to see the organization structures. You get to see the culture. You get to see all of the inner workings of all of these different companies and then help them really strategize around how they present to large retail. Um, so I did it for about 10 years. It was a lot of fun. I never thought, I thought I would be there forever. That's certainly when they interviewed me, they thought, they said, you're never going to go on another interview again. Um, and I was recruited really heavily from Highline Warren and the business is just really interesting. They wanted to bring someone in who could create a team and a strategy around some of their major automotive retail accounts. And the, their business, Highline Warrens, is, I guess, our business now. It's, it's so big, and it's, so, it's growing in a really rapid sense. They brought in and combined two big companies, um, Warren Distribution, which is an oil and lubricant and chemical manufacturer, with Highline Aftermarket, who um, distributes chemicals and all, all kinds of things to the aftermarket. By combining those two companies, they have created um, a real powerhouse in both manufacturing as well as distribution. And... And so I think there's so much potential there. They've got a ton of proprietary brands. So it was a really exciting opportunity that still gave me a lot of that diverse perspective. I can talk about oil. I could talk about wash. I could talk about you know, accessories, automotive, in all of the different realms of the business. Um, and then building this team around our auto retailers. So AutoZone, Advance, O'Reilly, and Napa. And it's a big challenge. I'm not sleeping a lot. It's been just under two years. But I'm having a ton of fun doing it. And at all the while, right, at N.A. Williams, when I was um, a woman who they brought in as somebody with a diverse background who had a different way of thinking, I found this group, Women in Auto Care. And after my first conference, I raised my hand and I said, how can I help? Where do you need me? And so I spent time helping them with marketing or helping with sponsorship and scholarships in a lot of different realms. And in 2020, in March, I think in February, actually, we had a conference right before the whole world came apart. And I was the mentoring chair. So I, we had a small committee of about six or eight people, and I was going to be the mentoring chair. And then, of course, COVID happened. And I'm really proud of what we were able to put together during that time. People needed connections. They needed touch points. They needed to see people's faces. Um, so we created a whole realm of events, and it was 
several different opportunities every single month for people to connect and get together and talk about what was going right and what was going wrong in their lives. And I am so proud of the resiliency of our industry, and I am just deeply honored for that. And during that time, our chair um, was pregnant, and she went on maternity leave and asked me to take over as chair. So I did that um, for a, a part of her stint, and then um, once she rolled off, I became full chair, and this will be my last year. I'll turn it over at our next conference to Ellie Lawhead, and I'm, I can't wait to see what the rest of the committee does. Like I said, it was eight people, and now I think we are up to 17 people. Wow. So we're building a bigger boat because we have a bigger community and we have more needs and we're trying to touch people in so many different ways. It, it's so cool to see the evolution of it. And you're right. Uh, that, that time in 2020 was not the easiest to navigate. And I think it reinforced how much we need that human element, right. And how, how much we need to, to talk to each other. So I, uh, I can, empathize with the challenges that came along with that. That was uh, that was a really challenging time. I'm curious with your background, the similarities and the differences between what you came from to the automotive world. And are there any parallels that you see with maybe some of the small businesses that are out there or with our industry as a whole? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. It, they're all, we're all just trying to make money. We're all just trying to take care of our families. And I think that there are such great people um, on, on all sides of our, of that, of the previous industry, as well as this industry. I'm always a little intimidated because I am not, I don't, I'm not, a, I'm not a person who does wrenching. I don't work on my own car. I've changed my oil. I've changed some light bulbs. I have tried very hard to make sure that I've done a few of the things that I'm selling but I'm always a little intimidated around people that do like, like you had Carolyn on earlier who owns a shop on the West coast and she runs a hybrid shop and how cool is that? <laughs> and so right. she knows so much about the industry and about technology and trends that are happening. And that's certainly something that is new for me in this industry. Yeah. And I, I think it's not just you, right? I think everybody, when you get into this industry, it, it can be an intimidating industry to get into. I grew up in it. I was fortunate enough to grow up in it, but there's still situations that you walk into that you're nervous about or that you, you know, you always hear about uh, or read about like the imposter syndrome, right? And like being maybe not feeling that you're at the level that you should be, or that, that maybe you're in a position that you shouldn't be, but I think everybody feels that. Right. And I think it's something that, you know, as a young professional and growing up in the industry, it, it's something you get past and you just get past it with experience, right? Like it's just, the more you throw yourself at things like you've done, the more you become ingrained in the community and, and the tougher it is to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I've been in it for, I guess, just under 15 years now. And yeah, you're right. And I, it seems like it's a place that people come and they're happy and they do not leave. And for the most part, right? right. I mean, we certainly in 2020 had a caregiver crisis where it was really difficult. And a lot of people had to figure out different methods to take care of themselves and their families. Um, but I am, I'm really proud to be a part of it. And I couldn't be any more honored to have been asked to be the chair of women in auto care. I, I know it is this huge responsibility, Jay. Like, we have a million women in this industry and I am the one person that was asked to be chair. And that's, it's a big, big deal. And I don't yeah. take it lightly. Right. So I, I want to make sure I don't let anybody down and then I'm continuing to build the programming that our community needs. It's a big community, but it's still not enough of a community, right? It's not yes. enough of a, uh, we don't have enough females in our industry. And I think that is a, a reason why what you're doing is so important. And really what we're here to talk about today is, is how do we get more women involved? How do we get them excited about our business and our industry? And it, it hasn't been an easy route, right? I mean, there's a reason why women in auto care exists and it's to make this more inclusive and, and make it a little bit more accepting. When you look at it, do you see opportunity there as far as being able to get more, more females into this industry? Yeah, absolutely. Look at how happy, I mean, I'm having a great time, right? I've listened to your podcast. You have a lot of women on your podcast that are thrilled with the careers that they have had with the growth trajectory 
um, you asked a really tough question, which is how do we how do we get more? And I that's a that's really tough. Um, and I think it comes from a lot of different angles. I think the first one I is that we have to retain the people that we have. We've got to make sure that we're keeping those people. And that's we could have a whole podcast just about how to <laughs> retention. Um, and I think attraction is is important too. How do we attract people? If you had told me I was in this industry, I probably would have looked at you as big guys. I, I, the automotive aftermarket, I wouldn't have. It would have been like saying, "Become an elephant." I, I didn't know there was that part of the business when I was in high school. So, you know, awareness is probably really important. And there are a lot of people out there in organizations like Women in Auto Care who are trying to bring more awareness to it, and and trying to make it a, a better place to be. And you said you've had a conversation with Kathleen Long about inclusivity. And I think that's a really big piece of keeping people here, making them feel included and like a part of the team. So if you're having a golf outing, is everyone inviting, in, invited? Are we doing golf every year? Are we maybe doing other activities that other, everybody wants to do? Um, so that is, that, again, that could probably be a whole other episode. And it sounds like you and Kathleen addressed a little bit of that last week. Yeah, she's awesome. And uh, as most of our guests, it just blows my mind, uh, the, the people that were able to get on and, and talk a little bit differently than maybe you would in a, a typical business type of conversation. So it is uh, it is cool. And I think it shows, you, you talk about the amount of women we've had on the podcast, and I think it shows the talent level that's maybe even untapped out there, right? There's so many super talented females in our industry that don't get the visibility that maybe they deserve. Um, and, and I say the same thing about technicians in general, right? A very, very smart crowd oftentimes don't have their voice heard because they're, you know, on, on, in the shop working. Right. And so I think when I look at the opportunity that's there, I think you hit it on the head in terms of keeping them, but then what are we doing to gain that visibility? What is it that we can do more to get out in front of, of young females and show them that this is a viable career option? Is it something where we just need to be more present in schools? Is it something where we need to just show the examples of the successful women that are already out there uh, to attract more? Is it kind of a combination of a whole bunch of things? Yeah, you had somebody on recently who talked about recruiting young people. And I think what she said was, we've got to do a it's not in high school. It's we got to be in middle school. You got to be in elementary school. And my friend Ellie, who's our vice chair, Ellie Lawhead, she and the AutoZone team, they work with the Girl Scouts of America, which I think is what a perfect place to start, right? Right. All these Girl Scouts can come in and they can see these incredible female leaders at their local company here, AutoZone in Memphis, and they can say, wow, that's a career I think I could get interested in. Look at those amazing people and what they've done for themselves and their families and where they're going. Um, so, yes, I, I think the Girl Scouts is, is a great opportunity. And I think your guests mentioned the Girl Scouts as well. Yeah, that's a great, I mean, a great example of a way to get out in front of young people. And I, I think the more we get more success stories, the more we get more uh, – visibility to the the women and I, I talk a lot about technicians right and there's a huge opportunity for women technicians and the fact that you know it was kind of ignored for a long time right the the fact that you know w what percentage of our population is female and what percentage of our population are technicians it's a i mean it's a drastic difference right yeah, I, I think it's 52% of the population, at least in America, I believe, is our women. And I think our technicians are less than 3%. And it, that's why we're giving away so much in scholarship money. Last year, we gave away $350,000 in money and in tools. Tools are one of the biggest barriers. You know this. You have technicians. You go to school, and it's not just a couple of books you have to buy for a couple of hundred dollars. It's thousands of dollars worth of tools that you have to show up with in order to become a technician. I don't know about you, Jay, but when I went into college, I didn't have thousands of dollars lying around to buy books. I had a scholarship, and what the scholarship didn't pay for, I worked for. You know, So to think that you, you have to be so passionate about this industry that you are willing to go out and spend thousands of dollars. So I'm so proud of what our, our organization has done in partnership with NAPA uh, and Milwaukee Tools and, and Acuity Insurance in order to give full pallets of tools to people that are interested in this industry. That's a big deal. 
How, how did you pull that together? Like what, what happened to make all of this work? Well, we're super lucky. We have amazing sponsors, right? So we came to the table and we noticed a need and we asked you know, all of our scholarship winners, what else do you need? How else can we be helpful to you? So two big things that we did were we started to give away tool scholarships. Um, we started to send them these tools and we reached out to everybody we knew in our in our community and we said, who can help us donate these tools? And we had tons of people who raised their hands and I think we probably will have even more this year and we'll just have to figure out how do we continue to distribute them. We've had to find places that all of the tools can ship and then we send a team of people out there to pack all of the pallets and then make sure that the pallets get shipped and arrive at the person. Sometimes it's an apartment and you, you're at a, a second or third story apartment and this giant pallet comes and you have to figure out how you're going to receive it. So there's some logistics there. Uh, and I think the other thing that we're really working on with our technicians is um, one of our former chairs, one of our former board members cre created these small groups. So anyone who won a scholarship was asked if they wanted to participate in a mentoring circle for scholarship winners. So specifically for anyone who won scholarships, she created between three and five groups each year that we've just started. And, um, and then these groups can get together and they can work with each other as well as a technician and a shop owner. And then they bring in speakers throughout the year and on different topics that are of interest. So making sure that we don't just give them the money and give them the tools and then walk away, making sure that we're, we're keeping them as a part of our community and letting them know that they have mentors and they have people to reach out to for apprenticeships or job opportunities. You know, you might have thought you wanted to go into the automotive aftermarket in this particular realm, but maybe there's something else that you get excited about when a speaker comes and talks to you. I, I, I'm interested in what subjects you talk about because I think you're, you're, you, you hit it right on the head with the amount of opportunity that's available once you get into the industry. That's something I didn't understand as a young person coming into this industry, into this business, was that you know, how big it is. Like there are so many different opportunities. And, and for me, I'll talk to a lot of young techs about this, where if you get in and you get that technical background, really at this point, the sky's the limit. It is a, it is something that is, uh, I think fascinating because it is, uh, um, if you don't have visibility to it, if you don't know the opportunities that are out there, uh, it's hard to see those. And, and so I, you know, going back to your point, I think creating that and just talking about it goes a long way. I, I mean, I, if you don't know that it's an opportunity, you're never going to go down that path. So it has to be put out there in a sense and in a way that feels approachable enough for you to take the next steps to go to, to go to school to become a technician or to go to school to get to get to the business side of the automotive aftermarket. We just launched our new weekly game on Shop Talk, The Loneliest Number. Each week, we will post short poll questions on Shop Talk about industry topics. Technicians who answer the questions will earn points to play the game and get a chance to win our $1,000 weekly prize. $500 will go to the lucky winner, and the other $500 will go to a local high school program picked by the winner. Start playing now at wrenchway.com slash shop talk. Link is in the show notes. Do you think there's challenges? It, it, maybe this isn't a great way to ask that question. I should, I should circle back or, or move back here and, and maybe rephrase this. There are definitely barriers for a female getting as in as a technician, right? And and I think we'd be lying to ourselves if we said that there weren't. But I think there's so much uh, we as an industry, I think, have in the last few years gotten significantly better at at trying to adapt to that. And one of those things that I talk about, or that I've self admitted that I wasn't great at when I was in the industry, was putting myself in a woman's shoes to be able to really understand the difficulties that were there. And I think when you get out and talk, we've had round tables in the past where we talk about getting uniforms that fit, or maybe a, a locker room for uh, our female staff, you know, those types of things that maybe not every shop can go put their own women's locker room in, but can you do something that makes it a little bit more accessible or a little bit easier on them and, and really understand what they're going through? Because 
I think that's what's going to help keep them in the industry. That's what's going to help them attract more females into the industry is if we just make it a little bit easier on them. Now, Jay, I heard you and Cheryl from Kadia talk about that, and you brought up such a good point, too. It's also about safety, right? It's not about comfort and fashion. Those are those things are important and nice, but it's also about safety to make sure that it's fitting properly. Um, and I think you know, even taking it the next step, making sure are we adding shirts that are available for maternity? And um, I know a lot of our retailers have done that in the past several years, and that's been a big boon to their ability to recruit and retain talent um, is in order to have those. And I, I think I told you my story, and this isn't in the workplace, but... I went to a baseball camp and I didn't know I was going to be the only boy at this baseball or only girl in an all boys baseball camp. And they threw everybody jerseys and said, all right, you are shirts and your skins. And I I yeah, Yeah, and I have uh, I've been really fortunate that I haven't worked anywhere that had uniforms. Um, But we have a lot of companies that do. Right. You go to Apex, you go to SEMA, most of those booths the people in there are wearing their company shirts. And that's a huge struggle that everybody's facing. Um, And and it certainly makes it more difficult to work there. And I'm really grateful that my companies never have, that they've always appreciated my style because I can be a little bit flamboyant. (laughs) (laughs) And it's part of my brand, so I would hate to quash it. But even if you told me I had to wear a blue suit, I would try to bring to it an element of style that was representative and felt like me. And I can't say that I've always been in that position. I came into this industry and I, I grew up at a time where you dressed for the job you wanted. Um, you didn't dress for who you were, you dressed for the job you wanted. So I looked around the table and I saw everybody wearing khaki pants and a button down shirt or a polo shirt. And I thought, all right, that's what I'll do. And I, I certainly came to this industry you know, just under 15 years ago and thought, all right, that's what I need to do. And I, and so I dressed like that for about a year. And then I realized, eventually they're going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so slowly but surely I started like bringing my full self to work and started you know, dressing in the way that I would normally dress. And I think it had a big difference on how I showed up at work, but I think it, it made me a better employee. Um, first and foremost, which is what they really wanted. Nobody ever said to me, Jessica, dress this way. (laughs) It's funny that you say that because uh, being a male coming up through the industry, that was very similar uh, in my regard, right? Like where all the guys are wearing polos with khakis or button up with khakis or whatever. And even though that wasn't probably my style, I conformed and I did it because that's what everybody else did, right? And I think... You know, now being more in the startup world, we, we're probably a little bit more lax on that. And and uh, um, the corporate America side was at times kind of uncomfortable in that regard because you're, you're just like, oh, all right, I guess I'm buying my 10th pair of khakis. And, uh, and this is my uh, I look like Jake from State Farm 100 percent of the time. Jay, very few people look good in khakis. It's just not the best pants choice. <laughs> I'm definitely not the one to take style advice from, though. I'll tell you that. (laughs) So uh, as we continue the conversation and we talk about bringing more females into the industry, I want to go back to what you talked about, those conversations and really the extension of, you know, kind of holding their hand as they get into the industry. What types of things do you talk about to make them feel more comfortable? So I, I think it's a full range. I think very often, no matter what you go to school for, you don't get a lot of business acumen, right? So they say, here's what you do, here's how you do it, here's how you're going to do X, Y, Z, but they don't say, here's how you run a shop, right? Here's how you deal with customers. Here's how you deal with a supply shortage, which everyone has experienced over the past few years. And so I think those are things that, that our groups have really helped. We, act, we also have a shop owner roundtable. It's all female shop owners, and I want to say there are 100 people in this group. It's pretty substantial. And it's a closed group, and they they deal with whatever the challenge of the week is. And so if they are struggling to you know, recruit people, then they talk about that. If they're struggling to figure out what their labor rate should be, then they talk about that. Um, and that's really interesting. And and how do you give insurance? How do you create a business license? Which association groups do you need to be a part of? And the only way to do that is by having the right network of people. And so we're trying to provide different platforms so that people have access to that. 
I, again, I think it's that community kind of feel, right? And one of those ladies that I think does a phenomenal job at it is Tara Topol. And Tara happens to be, um, you know, 45 minutes away from us here in Wisconsin. And uh, I, I haven't had the pleasure of going to visit her shop yet. They're actually a client of ours. And I was going to, to go over and check it out. But I've had numerous conversations with Tara now and I'm just blown away by how how motivated she is, right? Like how, how much she goes after stuff. And to me, that's the prime example of an independent shop owner that just gets it, that does it differently, that does it right. And I think because she surrounds herself with so many talented people, she's able to really shine. Also a member of our shop owner run table. She was one, uh, female shop owner of the year for 2021. I think they've just been expanding their shop right now. Um, so it'd be a good place to go check out. Yeah, they, they have yeah. really impressive facilities. Uh, you know, they, it just, uh, I don't think what they have is what you think of when you think of an independent shop, right? Like it, it, it's a, it is a really, really nice facility. Uh, she's a world-class person, uh, first and foremost. And, uh, it, it's those kind of people that I think it's, that makes it easy to root for. Right. And it shows an example. We talk about trying to bring more females into the industry. Here's one that's just absolutely kicking butt and doing a phenomenal job at it. And the, the more we can get a person like Atara into the, the spotlight, the more others will see that and say, Hey, you know what? She can do it. Like that, that opens the opportunity, opens the, uh, I guess I, I guess she helps shift the paradigm, right? And, and, and like I, I think it's a uh, just a mindset that when you have somebody like that that's super motivated and just incredibly good at what she does, it kind of paints the path for everybody else. Yeah, you have to see it to believe it, and you have to believe it in order to achieve it. And she's creating that opportunity for people to see and as a, as an incredible role model. And. Th I can't imagine she's the only one, right? You have this this uh, this thing where there's just a an abundance of just extremely talented females. Yeah, we really do. Every we give an award, one just one award away for a female shop owner of the year every year, and it's really tough. We want to give it away. To, I I do. I want to give it away to at least five or ten people every year because they deserve it. <laughs> right. And so we added a category this year for female shop team member. So if you're not an owner, but any other member, if that is you're the manager, if you are a technician, whatever you are. And we had so many applications that I, I want to give it away to more people. <laughs> those are the stories that we need to tell, right? Are, are those, you know, the ones that came through that application process being able to talk about their backgrounds and how, you know, similar to what we did with you starting off here today, right, is being able to share their stories of success and, and show that even though it's a male-dominated industry, there are so many opportunities for talented females in this business. And the more we do that, it feels like a little bit at a time we just chip away at it, right? We just kind of – we keep sharing these stories. We keep getting exposure to – these young people, uh, you know, you talked about elementary schoolers, uh, middle schoolers, and not only just the kids, but their parents, right? Because I think if you're talking to that young, that, that young female, and we say this a lot about, uh, about anybody, right? Male, female, doesn't matter. Uh, you've got to be able to kind of sh sell the parents on it a little bit, because if you have that smart, that smart young lady that gets really good grades and they tell their parents, I've talked to one, uh, I've talked to numerous, actually, of young female techs that came into this business and how many of them told me that their parents almost were like, what, are you kidding me? Like, you're going into that after you worked so hard in school? And I, I think that, you know, we talk about the young kids all the time, but the parents are such a, you know, that that's their little kid. That's what they're proud of. That's what they, they brought up. And when they say, Hey, I'm, I, I really want to go work on cars. We can't have that be a bad thing, right? Like we, we need that to be looked at in a different light. Yeah. And it can be a great career. I mean, I, Carolyn said, right. She's her texts are making a hundred thousand dollars a year. 
fantastic. I know Jill Trotto, she went to college, she was doing a great career and she didn't love it. And so she went back and decided that she was going to do it. And now she has a phenomenal career that she is. Right. I, I can't even tell you how much she makes making. I'm sure it's a lot. Right. So the potential is definitely there. And you're right. It's the perception. I, I guess I, we should, send more people to technical school. I, we should all have a technical skill. We should all be able to fix some things around our house and around our cars. What an incredible opportunity to go to technical school. But you're right, the perception from parents and teachers at some places and not everywhere, but certainly at a college preparatory school, they're not going to be encouraging you to, to try tech school. You talk about awareness, and I, I I don't have it right in front of me, but one of our, uh, this is on the dealership side, one of our clients uh, put together a women's workshop uh, kind of kind of thing, and they're promoting it, and it was, you know, regardless of what shop you represent, whatever, we are having this workshop for, uh, for high school, uh, ladies in high school to, to come to and be able to learn about uh, car repair. And I'm like, what a cool idea, right? Like just to like bring them in, you know, even if it is just showing, you know, the, the simple things, maybe that piques an interest in somebody saying, Hey, Oh yeah. You know what? I can't actually do this. Like they, there's tools in place to, to make it easy for me to come in and do this. Um, are, are, do you see, like, maybe I, I want to speak to the independent side a little bit more here than the dealer side, because uh, that was a dealer example. They did a phenomenal job. But on the independent side, we see not only a struggle with maybe getting young ladies involved, but getting young people involved in general. And I think there's such an opportunity there where maybe it is putting together some type of clinic. It is putting together some type of job shadow program. Do you see the independent side maybe getting better in this regard? I think about Michelle Tanzi, who is a shop owner in the Silicon Valley area. And during the pandemic, they launched something, I forget the name of it, but it was something about wine and Wednesdays. And every Wednesday, they would bring out some wine in, in the back of the shop, and they would talk about um, a particular car issue. And they, they live streamed it to all of their social channels. And they, and they taught people during the pandemic, everybody was hungry to learn something or to tackle a new skill. I thought that was a really good idea. And I imagine that there are lots of opportunities like that, um, that small shop owners. I think Tara does something, our, our female shop owner of the year, Christy, she does something similar where she really helps women get into the industry and, and helps teach them from a young age. But, you know, perception is hard. Perception is going to be hard, right? The parents' perception is going to be very difficult. Um, that's a societal issue that we can, that it's not going to be something that Jay and Jessica can address. Right. But certainly just educating and bringing more of those examples and making sure that there are shops and schools and that they have access to, to the tools that they need. And I, I wasn't allowed to go buy my first car until I knew, could change a tire, right? Just in case you don't really want to be stranded on the side of the road, coming home from school or a library and not and be stranded and stuck and not be able to handle that for yourselves. And you mentioned tools, right? And something that was brought to my attention that I don't know that much about because I'm not an ASC certified technician is that a lot of the tools are designed for a male hand. And so there is a need for the less than 3% of technicians that are women to have slightly a different tool. And I think that that would be something really interesting for a group of people to get together and figure out because right now it's a chicken and egg situation. If you're a big company, how the market isn't big enough for you to invest in the R&D to take care of this population, but that population can't get bigger until they have the tools that fit their hands and they're able to do the job for themselves. Such a good point. Again, I feel like an idiot because I, I had I never <laughs> thought about that before. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I didn't think about it much either, but I know my brother's a fighter pilot. And he talked about how like the seats are specifically designed in such a way that they're designed for a male shape and they're, they have to be in them for 16 hours or so and they have to be able to go to the bathroom in them. And so they're set up in a way for a man to do that. And to set it up in a way for a female to do it requires a different seat. Um, and again, a chicken and egg situation. You have to have the female fighter pilots, but you can't recruit them because they can't get in the planes, can't get the hours because you don't have the seat. It is such a good point. And, you know, for those tool manufacturers, if you happen to be listening to this podcast, I think there is a big opportunity there. And not only, you know, not only from a 
perspective of just making the tools to fit. And if you're looking at how, you know, how do you make money off of that? Like what a marketing opportunity, you know, like it, 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 it's right there in front of you. Yeah. I, I mean, and we're not talking about just turning it pink or purple, right? We're actually talking about turning the tool into something that is more usable for the hands of the female who's operating it. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. That's, um, Another opportunity. I feel like every time we talk about this topic, I always learn something and I always learn mostly that I'm just an idiot, but like the, <laughs> <laughs> the fact that there's so many opportunities for us to get better in this industry uh, is, is mind blowing to me. Right. And I, you know, I, I don't mean to pick on the independent side because as most that listen to this podcast know, I came from, you know, my background is independent shop. Right. And, and so when I look at this and you look at the different opportunities there are to nurture a, a talent network to bring them up into the industry, what a simple and fun thing to do, you know, something like a workshop, right? Something where you can bring young ladies in and have them actually see the shop and see some of the cool tools that we've got and the technology that's behind it. Right. You talk about tools being, a little easier for females to use. We talk about this all the time. The technology is forcing us to, you know, where a lot of it's driven by a computer, right? Or a scan tool or something along those lines where it wouldn't be difficult for a female to do that. And maybe they're, you know, a a female's brain might work a little differently and we'd be shocked at how good they are diagnostically. Right. And that's been my experience. A lot of times when I was hiring female technicians is that, once they get in and get comfortable, my goodness, you can turn out some good talent. Yeah. Yeah. And Cheryl, when she, on your podcast with Kadia, she talked about the facial recognition software and how it's really great at recognizing white men. And she said, well, that's because the people who designed it were all very similar. Right. So if we think about these tool companies and since you called them out, like let's challenge them, right? <laughs> who is on your R&D team? Do you have a diverse group of people on the team from different elements of life and diversity in all senses um, to look at those tools and to make sure that they're being designed in such a way that they can be used for everybody? And not just painting them purple or pink. I thought I, I got a kick out of that when you said that. That's, uh, that's, that's what funny. the technician said to me. It was so interesting. It was something that I, like Jay, like you, I'm, I didn't, I never thought about that. Thank you, Truck Country and Stoops Freightliner Quality Trailer for being a sponsor of Beyond the Wrench. Truck Country and Stoops is the largest family-owned and operated Freightliner dealer group in the U.S. today, serving customers in locations of Illinois, Iowa, Indiana, Ohio, and Wisconsin. For nearly 60 years, they've offered new and used medium and heavy-duty trucks, expert service, and extensive parts inventory, and more. If you're wanting to learn more about Truck Country and Stoops, visit truckcountry.com. How important are those conversations that you have with females in the industry? And when I say females in the industry, I want to talk about the technician side because, you know, when we talk about less than 3%, I will say there the needle has shifted a little bit, right? I think for the longest time it was less than 1%. Now it's getting closer to that 3%. Maybe we get to 5%, right? It's just it's a little bit at a time. But uh, walk me through the importance of actually having conversations with, with female technicians that are out there. So we have more female technicians than we have electric vehicles on the road as a percentage, right? So that's a good sign maybe. Right, right. <laughs> technicians. Um, yeah, I think it comes to the eye, right? We talk about um, we talk about diversity and we talk about equity, but how do we make people feel included? And that's what those conversations are about. It's about knowing that you have a familiar face and a familiar voice and someone that's rooting for you and someone that you can call when you've had a really tough day or a bad experience. Um, so I, I think those conversations are everything. And I think that's a lot of what the conference is about conferences and what our groups and what all of our virtual events and connection circles and mentoring are really about is knowing that you have a network of people that are pulling for you. One thing that I struggle with, and and I've talked about this with others before, is not going over the top, right? So say you have that shop, you're managing that shop out there and you bring a female technician in and 
you don't want to treat them differently because you don't want them singled out. But at the same time, you also know that there might be different needs uh, and you're trying to accommodate them. I think I'm far more of the uh, <laughs> the actions where I'm like going to unintentionally like make it uncomfortable, right? Where I'm trying to drive acceptance and I'm trying to make, make it be different. But I remember talking to a, another female technician that was like, Jay, you're, you're kind of doing the opposite here because what you're doing is singling me out. And, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm doing something good by, you know, just emphasizing how cool it is. But then at the same time, it's like, well, yeah, you're also putting a bunch of attention on me that I don't want. And so I, I feel like there's a fine line there, and I'm interested to hear if you've got any insight there. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with intention and vulnerability and just communication, Jay. It sounds like you and I have had a couple conversations, and it has. it does sound like you do a really nice job of communicating, hey, I feel weird about this. Tell me what, you know, please like, raise your hand and tell me if I'm saying something or doing something wrong. I can't tell you the number of times that I'm, I bite my tongue. Sometimes I hear something, I think, Oh gosh, I wish they hadn't said that <laughs> right? um, for their behalf and everybody else's. Um, and perhaps it's on me to right stop biting my tongue and maybe say something in order to make sure that we're educating people. It sounds like you're doing that, right? You're having those tough conversations. You're being vulnerable. And I think that's a, it's a fine line, but it, it, it comes from a good place, right? It comes from a good place of intention from you. Yeah. And I think that's most people, right? Uh, that, like as we grow this industry, like people want to do the right thing. It's just a matter of maybe fully understanding what the right thing even is. And, and, you know, we, you and I had talked about the verbiage and, and just how we talk about things and, and, you know, a common thing in the Midwest is we'll say you guys all the time. And I'm like, I, I caught myself the other day after we talked for our intro call saying, Hey, you guys. And I was like, I, I don't I'd like it, that's ingrained in you from when you're a child. And I'm like, I don't even know if I have the capability to take that out of my vocabulary. <laughs> I know. Um, but the way the English language was written, you is plural and it's singular. And in the South, people have tried to say you all. But in the Midwest, I grew up, I'm Midwestern. And um, if for, it's something that comes out of me, too. And it's something that I'm really actively working to remove from my vocabulary. Um, and I'm not perfect. I, I Like you, I did it last week. <laughs> and then I said, oh, I apologize. I need to take that rewind, pull it back in. Because I want to be intentional with my language. I don't want there to be a word that I say that causes someone else to bite their lips. It's funny because you you also said ope, which is a Midwestern thing as well, from what I'm told. And uh, there's actually a bar local to us here where they just uh, there's a comedian, local comedian that uh, just makes fun of it and makes fun of our like the Midwestern <laughs> language. And there was a bar that went up down the road called the Ope House, and uh, it, it's so it's a uh, it's kind of a funny thing. And I think my biggest thing is like how do you make sure you're not offending people? I, I try not to offend people. I'm sure there's something I'll say today that will offend somebody. And it's, it's, uh, it's hard to, as a passionate person, it's hard to, to walk that line. Right. And it's hard to like, take a step back, take a breather and just be like, okay, don't say that. Yeah. You know, I had a, a conversation with somebody and she said something that made me a little uncomfortable and Five minutes later, she picked up the phone and she called me back and she said, you know what, Jessica, I said something that I feel weird about. And I just want to say I'm sorry. And that was such a great cover. I, I was so appreciative of the fact that she did that. And so that's something that I've taken forward. And that when, idea. I, when I do it and I walk away, I don't just, you know, it doesn't, I don't try not to let it keep me up at night. Right. I try to make sure I call the person back, send them a note and say, um, hey, you know what? That didn't land right. I'm sorry about that. That's good advice in general, because that that can eat you up too. Uh, just, you know, knowing that maybe you said something you shouldn't have. Um, I think for those technicians that are out there, I think, you know, I, I've, I talked about this in that podcast with Cheryl that we're, we talked about having somebody in the shop atmosphere and myself as a manager being almost freaked out by how the techs were going to treat this individual. Right. And, and 
it was one of those things where you have to think through it a little bit more. And I think that's the hardest part is it takes, you know, as, as you're looking to build your shop and you're looking to build uh, almost the diversity of your shop in general to take a step back and, and think about the way you approach things and the way you go at things, because you may try, you may be trying to motivate somebody or trying to get them, you know, you're doing it for a good reason, mm -hmm. but maybe you step on toes. Right. And, and that's not the intention, but we need to maybe do a little bit better job at, at being intentional about what we're talking about. Yeah, and what, Jay, one of the things that I think our, we're trying to figure out is that we want to make sure that it's very important to me that we are inclusive. And that means everybody. I do not just mean women, right? I want to make right. sure everyone feels included. And Charlie Ayers, who from CCA. I know Charlie. Yeah, you had him on a few weeks ago. Um, he's been coming to our conference for longer than I have, forever. And so maybe he is a really good person to talk to, for us to both talk to and, and think about like how do, how is our language affecting and how are we doing a better job at recruiting? Because he's clearly doing a great job at it and is so passionate about it. He has been, he's come to more conferences than I have. Um, and he's always the, the calm voice of reason in the room. He raises his hand. He's a mentor. Um, we need more people like that, like you and like Charlie, you know. Well, more like Charlie, because I, whenever I talk to him, he, he is very calm. I feel like if I'm anxious or uh, nervous, I should just give Charlie a call because he'd call me right down. <laughs> He's just a good guy. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's a good leadership lesson, right? How do you remain really calm in the storm? I'm lucky that the, um, my boss right now and, and our chief commercial officer are two people that are able to deliver intense, serious messages in the most calm manner. I need more of that. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, that, um, and I wouldn't say that I'm a like fired up all the time type of person, but it is like, I'm again, very passionate. And when I, when I talk, I get really excited about things and it's not like yelling. It's just more like, all right, let's go more of a cheerleader, like that kind of person. And not everybody, uh, not everybody wants that kind of coaching or leadership. And, and it is kind of the evolution of a leader in general is just trying to trying to figure that out. Yeah, you have how, to lead the team you have. Yeah, 100%. So how do, how do you see this continuing to grow? Uh, how do you see us growing the share of females in the industry? Is it just continuing to have these conversations and chipping away at it? Is there anything that you would think is like a home run, like we can just do this and it's going to bring a flood of females into the industry or it, I'm guessing it's going to take some time, right? Oh my gosh, it, there's not one thing. We've talked about a lot of different things, right? Retention is really important. How do we make sure we're keeping them? How do we make sure they feel included once they get here? And I hope that women in auto care is a place for them to start that journey. Um, how do we recruit at a younger age, right? How do we reach out to the Girl Scouts? It's also, there's a like a grassroots to tree chops that we have to think about, right? I think we're recruiting a lot of young women in the industry, but are we making sure that we're keeping them? Are we making sure that, that we have this um, career trajectory that gets them to the top? And the way that we do that are with people at Charlie's level, right? People that are presidents and people that are in the C-suite. And how are we making sure that the message is coming from the top and the bottom and then resonating throughout the organization? Because I think if you have one or you have the other, it doesn't work. You really need both in conjunction. And our, our group, um, we launched an executive champion group, and it's all women that are either in the C-suite or the executive level positions this year. Um, and the power and energy that they're able to bring are, are really new. And the other thing you talk about technicians, we are making sure that our board holds seats for female shop owners or technicians, so that we are representative of our entire industry. Right? We're a really diverse kind of complicated industry that I'm not sure I fully understand all of the different steps and pieces and parts. But when we put together a board for women in auto care as an auto care association com um, community, are we making sure that we represent each and every part of our industry, right? From retailer, from manufacturer, from distributor, um, all the way, you know, all the way up across and down and, and backwards. It's funny that you say this with, as it relates to females, because we talk about it as it relates to the entire industry, right? Even that, that young tech that, you know, the more traditional male uh, tech that's coming in, we got to get better there too, right? Like we, we, we've got to get better at taking care of these people. And I think 
it is as much a mindset as anything, just being determined to change and being determined to adapt to, to be a better place to work. And it's not like I'm saying shops are a bad place to work. I'm just saying there are opportunities for improvement. And if our mindset's in the right, the right space, I feel like we can, we can make a, we can make up a lot of ground. We can, we can do some things that we're, we're keeping our own. We're keeping them, we're taking care of them. And then once we really focus on taking care of them, then it makes an, an easy decision for that young person, that young female to come into the industry because uh, we've changed and we've adapted and, and we've made it a better place to be. I think Carolyn said it really well. She said, we don't have a recruiting problem. We have a paying problem, right? If we yeah. paid as well as coding paid, more people would be interested. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think that we've done enough studies on, on our pay scale. And I, I certainly doubt that we've done a lot of studies on in this particular segment of the industry. How are women paid in comparison to men? Are the female technicians being paid the same? Um, are the female employees in the entire automotive aftermarket being paid similarly? I know some of the dealerships and some of the OEs have done that work, um, which is commendable. But I think there's probably a lot more to be done. Is that for is that work for this chair of the women in auto care uh, <laughs> sector or is that for the next chair? Yeah, that's a tough one to tackle. Right. Um, even Carolyn, said, even she said, right, it's tough, tough to tackle. When we talk about small businesses, small businesses have a certain amount of money that they can pay and that they can recruit and that they can charge for their labor hours. And then all the way up, you know, we, we, we're a, we're an incredible company. I'm really proud of my the Highline Warren. We have a chief information officer that's female. Um, our chief legal counsel is female and our chief operating officer is female. That's pretty cool. Right. So our company yeah. is saying that this is the place where women can raise to those levels um, and that we're giving you those role models in order to get there. I, I said that with our company, it was unintentional when we did it, but we have a lot of female leaders within our company and it wasn't because I was like, all right, let's go hire a bunch of females. It was just always because I was like, I, I want to find really smart people and figure out a way to make them, you know, uh, the, in, ingrained into our, our business. Right. And, it's been fun working side by side with with all of them to you know make the industry a better place to be. That's very much our you know the passion of our business in the first place, and I think to work side by side with them and see the talent level that is there and to see you know them put me to shame in a lot of <laughs> a lot of capacities uh, is is really rewarding because they are talented. They do deserve the spotlight, they do deserve, uh, you know, all of the, the good that comes upon them. So um, I think long way to go in our industry, but, uh, you know, I think we're at least moving in the right direction. If we can get mm -hmm. that 3% number to start to, to tick up even more, I think that's good. And hopefully that 3% is because we're adding so many females and not because we're losing people, right? Like, I, I think mm -hmm. that's another key piece. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I applaud everything that you're doing out there. Uh, again, just the the conference itself, seeing the feedback, seeing how many people you were able to get just genuinely excited about the industry and things that are going right in the industry. Um, pretty, pretty damn cool. So I, I applaud you for everything you're doing. Thanks. It's, it's really intentional. I, it, I make a very concerted effort. Our entire board does to make sure that people feel included. Our board does not sit at one table. We spread across. We make sure that we meet every new person. We make sure that we're shaking hands and that we're, we're forcing you to not just sit with the people that you came with, but that you're meeting new people um, because we're better as a community and we're stronger as a community and we're all going to want to stay in this industry longer if we have those connect connections and that network behind us. And, and I am really proud of it. I, and, and and it's a big it's a big honor. It's, there are a million women and I'm just the one and in charge of this for a very short period of time. So I, I take that responsibility very, very seriously. Well, you've done it very, very well. One thing I failed to mention uh, in the podcast is I think you might be the only person I've ever met that's been to Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, I did. I went last year over Thanksgiving. Um, Jay, it's beautiful. It's like, yeah. it's, like, it's like four or five different colors of blue in the water. It's spectacular. It's very cold. Um, I did a polar plunge. I know we talked about it. You've never done one, but you. No. We, I feel like we're going to do a fundraising opportunity <laughs> for our toolkit for somebody to get you into a polar plunge. It's supposed to be so good for your entire body. Um, 
it, but it's the kind of thing that you can't really prepare yourself for and you don't really know what's going to happen when you get there it you come out of the water and your lungs you can't get air into them it's a really eerie feeling and so for it feels like 90 seconds i'm sure it's like you know probably like half a second you cannot get the air into your lungs so you're standing there and thinking oh my gosh first of all it's freezing the wind is howling around you um, there's an iceberg floating next to me <laughs> and now i can't breathe um, but it was it was a really cool challenge um, the drake passage if, if people are interested in it you should look up there are lots of videos that talk about show how how scary and how dangerous and how high the swells are and at the same time you kind of feel like should i really be here right should i really be tramping on this ground so there the ships are very protective of the environment they're only allowed to be on the island for short periods of time you can't you know you can't walk anywhere you want there are designated areas so it's and they have to be scientific exploration cruises so there are scientists on board that are doing work and you are just along for the ride oh yeah it's I, neat. I just you you did this voluntarily though the the jumping in the water part <laughs> Jay, it was 2020 I hadn't gone anywhere in a while <laughs> Someone mentioned it to me, and I thought, yes, I need an adventure. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's, a, it's a really cool story, and I had the pleasure of listening to Jessica talk about the, the trip as a whole, and uh, just really, really cool, and so outside the box, and, and so unique, and, and uh, I think in a lot of ways uh, matches who you are. Very unique, and, and really, we're lucky as an industry to have you and uh, and look forward to at our, our next conversation. It's always a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks, Jay. I appreciate it. That wraps up this week's episode of Beyond the Wrench. Be sure to tune in next week for another brand new episode. As a reminder, don't forget to rate and follow Beyond the Wrench on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps us get beyond the wrench in front of other fantastic shop owners, managers, technicians, and dealers just like you, so we can continue to help improve, promote, and grow this amazing industry. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll be back next week. Music.